Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're gonna be discussing novice and intermediate level strengthening exercises for the cervical extensors, which really occupy the posterior aspect of the neck. Eventually, we'll be covering more advanced strengthening exercises, but before you ever attempt those, you need to first have a mastery of these types of exercises. And we're gonna cover these in general with increasing level of intensity and difficulty. Now, before we get into the specific exercises targeting cervical extension, I think it's important to understand a couple of things. Number one, what are the muscles that facilitate cervical extension, the muscles that we're trying to strengthen? And number two, looking at the basics of the journal article that we use to justify strengthening of the cervical extensors. So before we get to that, let's take a look at the muscles that are involved in this movement. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, the muscles that facilitate cervical extension are posterior neck muscles on the back of the neck. And there's different layers of these. The superficial muscles, it shows two of them here, there's actually three. The most superficial of all of these is the upper trapezius. And yes, it does facilitate a little bit of cervical extension when contracted bilaterally. And then underneath that, you have the splenius muscle group. Those are the splenius capitis, which is most superior, and the splenius cervicus, okay? These are gonna be two of the major workhorses of cervical extension. Then above those, and really, really deep, we have the suboccipital muscle group. Now, these facilitate upper cervical extension, which is involved in the movement of protraction. So in previous videos, we talked about cervical retraction, which is basically doing this, drawing the head posteriorly. This is going to put a stretch on the suboccipitals. So contracting those would be cervical protraction or upper cervical extension would be like this. And oftentimes when you have people typing in front of a keyboard, they're gonna have this cervical protraction, those muscles get tight, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about that in other videos. We don't really care so much about the suboccipital muscles. They contribute very, very little to overall cervical extension and what we're trying to strengthen. Again, we mostly care about these superficial muscles. And then down here, the transversospinalis muscles, the semispinalis capitis and cervicus, rotatories, cervicus, interspinalis, and intertransversari, these muscles probably don't contribute much to overall cervical extension. Instead, what they probably act more of is as proprioceptors. So monitoring where the head is in space relative to the torso and providing that information to the brain. What they've looked at in other studies, and I won't go into it here, is that these muscles have a much higher concentration of muscle spindles than other larger muscles. And usually muscles that have a high concentration of these muscle spindles don't really facilitate movement so much as they more are sensing the position of the head in space. They act more as proprioceptors. So when we're looking at these muscles, it's really just the superficial muscles that we're trying to, one, get stronger and also get hypertrophy in if that is your goal. That then brings us to this study, which was really instrumental in us knowing that yes, you can do these exercises and get these muscles stronger and possibly get a little bit of hypertrophy in these muscles. And this study was cervical resistance training, effects on isometric and dynamic strength. Now, without getting into too much of the details here, uh, what they did is they began with a warm-up set at 20% of maximal volitional isometric contraction. So they had to first determine what was 100% of MVIC. Uh, that's basically a 1RM of isometric strength. And they warm up at 20% of that with the given movements, which were flexion, side bending, and extension. And then they move into the working set of these exercises. And for extension, you'll notice it's different than flexion and side bending, which were done at 45% of MVIC. Extension was done at 75% of MVIC. Overall, extension is a stronger movement. And I think they knew that in order to get sufficient gains in extension, you had to load it up a little bit more than flexion and side bending. It's a stronger muscle group. It's gonna be able to handle a little bit more than the other movements, flexion and side bending, okay? And so there's some other details here that we really don't care about, but it suffices to say that in this study, they found that doing dynamic resisted cervical extension exercises yielded an increase in isometric, 
extension strength and dynamic extension strength. And they were statistically significant increases over 12 weeks. Now, with hypertrophy, they did not find a significant increase in neck circumference, but it is worth noting that there was about a half inch increase in the individual's neck circumference on average. And that's collectively for training flexion, side bending, and extension. So although it was not a significant improvement or increase, I should say, in hypertrophy, as in neck circumference, it did increase a little bit. And so it's plausible that as you continue training this over a longer period of time and with more advanced exercises, you would see a statistically significant increase in neck circumference if that is your goal. Now, as we did in the cervical flexion strengthening video, we're gonna start cervical extension with isometrics. Now, the cervical extensor muscle group is probably the strongest group in the neck much stronger than the cervical flexors for most people, and even stronger than the side benders and rotators. That being said, if you just use one hand to perform the isometric exercise, you're probably not gonna be able to give yourself enough force. The only way this would be okay would be one, if the person had shoulder problems on the other side and really just couldn't get their other hand back there, or if their cervical extensors for whatever reason were so weak, that one hand was sufficient. And I have seen that in one case before, and that was for a person with dropped head syndrome. Uh, they had a little bit of activity there, and we technically did this in a gravity minimized position, but one hand for them was sufficient to provide enough force. But for the vast majority of people, you're gonna have to use two hands to give yourself enough force. Now, your two hands are trying to tilt your head forward into flexion. Your posterior neck muscles are trying to tilt backward into extension like that without getting much extension of the thoracic spine. So let's take a look at that. I usually have people start by holding this for about five seconds. Here we go. And relax. And usually what I'll have people do is build up from five seconds to maybe a max of 10. Sometimes you'll hear people going as much as 30, 60 seconds. I do not think that is necessary. Once somebody can do 10 second holds of this pretty easily, no real increase in pain, no dysfunction, we need to be progressing on to other types of exercises. Let's take a look at those right now. I don't care what muscle group it is. As soon as isometric exercises become too easy, they're not associated with any pain and not associated with any kind of dysfunction. We want to progress into dynamic resisted exercises or isotonic resisted exercises. And so if we look at the paper that we introduced in the previous video where we talked about cervical flexion strengthening, they also looked at cervical extension strengthening. And the easiest way to reproduce the exercises that they did in this study is to either sit on the edge of a table or a chair and put a plate or some kind of weight on your head, hold it there with both hands and perform cervical extension, or you get in prone with your head hanging over the edge of a table, you begin in a position of cervical flexion, have the weight on the back of your head and perform cervical extension against that resistance. I don't like these movements for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're having to hold the plate on your head. And so you can't help but have a little bit of the resistance provided by your arms, not your neck muscles. You cannot avoid this whatsoever. The other problem is in the prone position. At some point, the weight will probably get heavy enough to where one, it's very awkward to get the weight on your head without having someone assist you to do that. But also, if you're not careful, you're fatigued, you could mess up a shoulder. If you're not careful, you could mess up the neck. It's a very awkward position and it can be difficult to bail out of that position. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. You should just be extremely careful. My favorite way to strengthen cervical extension is just to do it in sitting and to do it with a good old fashioned thick resistance band, pull up band, monster band, whatever you want to call it. Now, when we do this, we're not just going to have this on the back of the head, anchor these on the knees, because as soon as we come up, 
that band is likely to slide down. So what I prefer instead is, well, again, put it on the back of the head, but then get some resistance on there. And then as I come down, I allow the hands to move a little bit. And then as I tilt back, I allow the hands to move a little bit as well. And so the fact that I am allowing the hands to move here is making it to where the band is not going to slip off my head. If I want more resistance, I can obviously choke up on this, but the same is true. I'm allowing the hands to move up and down. That way, the band is not slipping off of my head, especially as it starts to get sweaty, okay? And if you do that, you will absolutely feel your cervical extensors working hard. Now, that is one way to do it. But my absolute favorite way to strengthen cervical extension is with a neck harness like this, okay? I'll show you how this works in just a couple of minutes. If you are going to get serious about training the neck, particularly the cervical extensors, I'm under the belief that every single person in that boat really should get a neck harness. And I'm gonna put a link to a couple of them in the, in the comments of this video. I'm gonna pin it at the top of the comments. But if you're gonna get serious about training neck extension, you really should have one of these. It is one of the safest ways to train neck extension because it's easy to bail. And also you have a lot more control of the weight that you're lifting on this. And it's much easier to get progressive overload with a neck harness. Let's take a look at that right now. So now I've got the neck harness on, the chain is anchored to one side of the harness. I'm gonna take the other end of this and loop it through the hole in this plate. And then we're gonna get it on the end here, okay? I'm gonna bring it into the position I want this in to perform the neck extension. I prefer to do this in some kind of a squat rack, something I can hold on to here to basically stabilize the rest of my body, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is with control, I'm gonna let my neck bend down and then extend up. Flex down with control, extend up. What you don't want is to be getting this. If you're having to do that, the weight is too heavy or your neck muscles are gassed out and you need to stop. As long as you can maintain this kind of control, you will be good. One other tip here. If while you are doing the lift, you, with moderate force, clench your teeth together, activating those masseters there, that creates some stability and it will actually make the lift a little bit easier. And no, it will not cause TMJ issues if you're just for a few seconds each repetition clenching your jaws. That is how you use the neck harness for neck extension. All right, so the last of the cervical extension strengthening exercises we're gonna be looking at in this video is the most basic form of a neck bridge. And to do that, we're gonna be using something like this. This is a Bulgarian split squat step. Very useful for a lot of exercises, obviously the split squat, but then also useful for neck bridges. You can also use the edge of a table. However, this table is a little bit too high and I'll explain why that is in just a minute. But to a regular bridge, now when we do a regular bridge, like this, minus perhaps our hands or arms, there are three points of contact with the floor. One and two are my feet, and the third is my upper back. So when we are doing a neck bridge, we still have the feet as points of contact, but the third point of contact is gonna be our occiput right on the stand right there. And the other consideration here is the height that this stand should be. So when I perform a bridge, I want this stand to be approximately the levels of my knees during the bridge. Obviously this table is a little bit too high, so I'm gonna do something a little bit lower like this, okay? So when I'm getting set up for this, I wanna make sure that my occiput is pretty firmly resting on this stand, okay? I'm gonna get in a bridge position like this, and then I'm gonna put my hands on my thighs here and then I'm going to brace the neck, brace the core, and exhale. 
There's my neck bridge. I can hold up here if I want to, but then come down with control. Now this is one exercise that I hesitate to call advanced because there's quite a few athletic people that can do this exercise. Uh, it's not quite wrestler's bridges, but it's the most advanced of the novice and intermediate level neck exercises. But because it is more on the advanced side of those, you absolutely want to make sure that if you haven't done so already, that before you do this, your neck is adequately warmed up. We go over a good warm up routine in a separate video, so make sure to check that out. I'll put it in the comments to this as well, okay? But make sure your neck is warmed up, particularly those deep neck flexors, okay? So again, we have our occiput resting comfortably on the stand. We're gonna do our best to keep those deep neck flexors engaged here. We're gonna keep our core engaged, and then we're going to inhale before we come up. Exhale and bridge. And then come back down. And you do enough of those and you'll absolutely feel your cervical extensors working. And they will probably get a little bit of a pump afterwards. That is completely normal. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding about how to strengthen the cervical extensor muscle group. In the next video, we're going to be discussing side bending or lateral flexion, and then after that, rotation. And then after that, we'll get into more advanced strengthening exercises, as we talked about earlier. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.